Okay, so uh, we're continuing on our, I guess our series of lessons on using um, the computer for inference methods and statistics. So, um, so on Friday we covered random number generation, just very, very, very briefly, okay? In, so a, a lot of these topics that I'm covering now, this can be classified under the topic of Monte Carlo methods, which is a, a huge part of statistical computing. Um, 102C is entirely devoted to Monte Carlo methods. Uh, it takes a, a little bit more of a theoretical approach in terms of the asymptotics of Monte Carlo methods and all of that. And, um, you know, here we're just kind of jumping from topic to topic, uh, just kind of giving, you know, maybe more like a Monte Carlo survey, I guess, would be a, um, a more appropriate name, just kind of t covering a few things and uh, doing a few things uh, here and there. So on Friday, we covered... Random, um, random number generation, we, uh, we said we can generate uh, uniform, random uniform numbers, uh, no problem. And then uh, if you want something other than random uniform, we looked at the acceptance rejection method and the uh, inverse uh, transformation method. The... Um, there, there are other methods for random variable generation. Um, for example, the Box-Muller uh, method for creating uh, random normal numbers, which uh, I'm sure you will be covered in great detail in 102 C. Um, but I think it's, it's okay for me to say uh, at this point in our technology, R is able to generate random numbers from many known distributions uh, very easily and with good random number properties. Okay, so so in today's lesson, we're, I'm going to just kind of make a call to um, ask for a random normal number, and I just ask R R norm, and uh, and it and it generates that, and I'm not really explaining how. How it works, but I'm just saying it does work. Okay, but we can we can use this to our our benefit. So statistical inference. Um, the idea be behind a lot of statistics is that we are trying to understand some property of the population, even though we can only observe a sample. And anytime um, anytime there's an estimate, anytime we have an estimate there's going to be uncertainty in that estimate. And when you look at only one sample, you don't have an idea of how much uh, uncertainty there is. Okay, So when you look at just one sample, you might be able to calculate the standard error. You might not be able to calculate the standard error based on, um, based on that estimate. And so we can use these... Um, probability distributions to generate samples and, and get an idea of, of that the variability in those estimates. Okay, so you know how much does the sample mean vary from sample to sample? We can get an idea of that by taking a bunch of random samples and comparing the means from sample to sample. Or how much does you know this and that vary? We can do that. Um, if we, these are often called bootstrap methods. Um, do you guys know the reason why it's called bootstrap? Okay, so well, there's a I don't know some Greek legend. I don't know if this is this is true or not. Even if I don't obviously. <laughs> well, okay. So so apparently you know the strongest man in the world says uh, I can. I'm so strong I can lift anything. I can pick anything up. And um, and then so whoever Plato or so whatever the uh, philosopher says, well, I bet you can't pick yourself up by your bootstraps, and uh, and he admitted defeat, right? So um, bootstrap here is kind of the idea of trying to pick yourself up by your bootstraps, 
in that we are not using anything outside of what we have and we're trying to answer the questions, okay? And so we're not gathering additional data, we're not doing anything like that. Um, we're just trying to, uh, to answer these questions with kind of the, the tools we have, our, uh, either our understanding of probability or just the, uh, the samples ourselves, the, themselves. So we have um, parametric bootstrap and non-parametric bootstrap. Parametric bootstrap depends on our understanding of probability distribution. So we're making some assumptions about the data we have. We're saying our data is coming from this probability distribution. So, so we're doing that. Uh, with non-parametric uh, bootstrap, we're not making any assumptions about the underlying distributions, and we're just going to deal with the, uh, the sample of data that we have. So uh, we'll, do a, we'll do a few demos here, and, uh, and we'll take a look, OK? All right, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling a few examples from this textbook, Statistical Computing with R. Uh, unfortunately, it's not free for you guys, so um, you don't have to buy it. I mean, if you want to, you can, but you don't have to. Uh, I think all the relevant information I'll, I'll put in my notes here, OK? So anyway, let's say uh, we are drawing two random variables, x1 and x2, and they are coming from the standard normal distribution. So x1 is coming from you know, your regular normal with mean 0 and variance 1, and x2 is also coming from the standard normal distribution. And what we want to do is we want to estimate the expected value of x1 minus x2, but the absolute value of that. So how, how would we solve this? So if you've taken 100A or 100B, you learn all of the, um, the methods behind trying to answer these questions of expected value and variance. And a lot of times, you, you're going to have to do integrals and uh, I'm actually, I'm very bad at integrals, okay? Like, I, I usually just go to Wolfram Alpha and say, can you integrate this for me? And if Wolfram Alpha can do it, then I'll be like, all right, great. And if it can't, I'll be like, oh, man. And then, uh, you know, you, in calculus, you have, like, the table of integrals, and you're trying to, like, match things, and you're like, oh, integrate, you know. So I, I'm really bad at it. So, so I often um, avoid the analytic method, which, you know, this is simple enough where we can do it analytically, um, but can it be done computationally? And the answer is yes, and we get um, a very high quality estimate of the true answer that comes from the analytic way. Okay, so if we wanted to do it analytically, uh, we would have to do it like this. So we would define W as the quantity x1 minus x2. Okay, and because it's a combination of two um, random variables that are normally distributed, W itself will also be normally distributed with mean zero, and then you add the two variances, and you get variance two, right? That, that, that so far we're all okay with, I hope, all right? And then um, we're going to say Z, we're just <clears throat> doing a Z transformation, standardizing it, so we subtract off the mean of 0 and divide by um, the standard deviation. So z is now uh, normally distributed with mean 0 and variance 1. And so we get the um, density function for z to be um, the density for standard normal. So, so far, so good. And then, so to get the mean of z, we're going to integrate z times p of z. So this is to get the uh, the mean you normally integrate z times its density from negative infinity to positive infinity, but because we just want the absolute value of z, we're going to integrate from 0 to positive infinity and multiply by 2. Does that sound reasonable? OK, and then so uh, we do this. And this is, kind of, this is like a tricky integral, right? So I didn't do it. I just I clicked Wolfram Alpha, and I said, can you integrate this for me? And it says. Uh, Sure. Oh, of course it doesn't work when, it, when I click this. 
Okay, and it says uh, it's one over the square root of two pi, which uh, I'm happy with. And then we, uh, we multiply that by two. And then so turning z back into w, um, we, um, we get w, the expected value of the absolute value of w equal to two over the square root of pi. Okay, and so we have, so this is what the true value of the, uh, of the mean will be. Okay, all right. Um, what about the variance? Or did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, you just look up, uh, I, don't, I don't have it memorized, I just look up normal distribution, and you go to uh, Wikipedia, and then you look at this thing right here, you plug in your mu and your sigma, so. I use the same tools you guys use, okay, for, <laughs> for answering um, for a lot of these questions, which, which I think is most everybody. All right. So, uh, so anyway, we have that. Um, the variance, you have to do um, the expected value of, you know, basically w minus mu quantity squared, right? Um, so, you know, it's even more complicated. You'd have to do another integral. Um, and like I said, I'm not good with it. And I tried to plug it into Wolfram Alpha, and it said um, you need to buy Wolfram Alpha Premium to answer this question. So I said, I don't know. Oh well, we're not going to do it then. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, it's supposed to be this two minus four over pi. However, however they get that, and we get this number here. Okay, so that's fine and all. Let's um, let's do it with R. Okay, and uh, and I have this um, I have this all here. Okay, so. Um, basically, we can do like, um, with something simple like this, we can do 10,000 or 100,000 or, or whatever, okay? So let's do uh, 10 to the fifth. So we'll say uh, the number of replications will be uh, 10 to the fifth, so that's 100,000, okay? And then um, x1, we're going to get uh, 100,000 values for uh, from the normal distribution and then we're going to do x2 same thing for x1 and x2 x so these are just uh, I've got a hundred thousand values from normal for x1 hundred thousand normal for x2 and basically all I'm going to do is just take each one x1 uh, minus x2. So this is just the, the first one. This is the difference if I look at x1, the first value in x1 and the first value in x2. If I take the difference between those, uh, I get that. So, um, so basically, I'm just going to say absolute value of x1 minus x2. And this will be kind of our, um, this is our variable w, right? If we define w as the absolute value of x1 minus x2, we're going to have w, and so w has 100,000 elements in it, OK? And then, so what's the average? I just ask for the mean of w, and I get 1.13372. And I can ask for the variance of w, and I get 0 0.72889. And those are our answers, OK? Uh, we, we can go back and just kind of compare how our estimates from the computational method compare with with their supposed theoretic values. Okay, so this, this is off by a tiny bit. One point one three three versus one point one two eight. Okay, uh, over here we have zero point seven two nine basically versus zero point seven two seven. Um, if you want more accurate numbers, you can just increase W. I'm sorry. M, so if I do a million, I can just do the same thing, and I, I can run through the same uh, commands. X1 is a million random normals. X2 is a million random normals. W is the difference between X1 and X2. Um, 
I can ask for the mean of w, which is actually much closer now, and the variance of w. And we can see how these compare. And so with something, um, something very simple, we can do um, you know, a million replicates, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't bog down our computer at all. Okay. Are, are there questions on this? Okay. You could, um, you could run a loop, but the loop will be very sm uh, slow. So R has uh, a lot of things optimized for vector operations. So in this case, these are the, uh, the operations we have here. That's for a million. If we want to do um, a loop, I'm only going to do like a thousand here, okay? And I'll say um, repeat zero uh, a thousand times or m times, and then we're going to say uh, four i and one through m. You can do um, x one is r norm one, x two r norm two one. And then w sub i is going to be absolute value of x1 minus x2. Okay, And so you can run this um, oh, well, with 1,000. It's very quick. But we'll see with uh, 10,000, it starts to slow down already. OK. And, uh, and your, comp, um, your estimates will only get better as you increase the, uh, the number of replicates here. Okay. All right. Um, so questions here? So all, all looks good? OK, and so um, we, can, we can answer this. Uh, so here I just you know, did a million, and I got this. And so um, the computer can ask. Uh, we, you know, you can create um, estimates of the uh, the standard error and create a confidence interval as well. Okay, so the standard error, um, especially with something like a million, you just do the standard deviation of w divided by the square root of m, and uh, and so you create the confidence interval. And when I did it um, in the document. Uh, you know, I got between 1.1278 or 1.1279 and 1.131, which indeed captures the true true value in the mean here. Okay. So I think this is pretty good. Uh, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to uh, to get this if you're just trying to get get a value um, without the exact um, mathematical rep representation here. All right. Um, here's uh, here's another method. Um, so we can talk about uh, getting the uh, the mean square to error. So anytime you come up with some kind of estimate, theta hat, the uh, the mean square to error is the the um, expected value between the estimate theta hat and the true value of the parameter theta. Okay, and you uh, you square that difference, and what's the um, expected value or the average in the long run? Okay. Um, we can get an estimate of the mean squared error uh, using using computational methods here. Okay, so so for example, um, you know how how well does the truncated mean compare with the actual mean as an as a, as an how does the truncated mean Compare as an estimator to the actual mean. Okay, so um, so in our case, we're going to use theta hat is not the regular mean, but will be the uh, the truncated mean, and, and I'll explain all this in a, in a second here. Right. So if um, if the mean squared error in the uh, in the long run, um, you know, is, is very small. Uh, that that's a good thing, uh, but here we're going to have the um, I'm sorry the trimmed mean, uh, and what this is is if you have the kth 
kth level trimmed mean, you're, you're dropping the k highest values and the k lowest values. So, um, I don't know, like in the Olympics, back in the day, they don't, they don't do the uh, gymnastics evaluations this way, but they, it used to be like you judge the, uh, the performance on a six point scale and you'd throw away the highest, highest um, entry and the lowest entry and then they would take the average of what's rem remaining, that would be an example of a trimmed mean. And that kind of helps prevent, I don't know, an angry or biased uh, biased person from, from throwing off the results. Um, so anyway, um, we can do like the second level trimmed mean on for samples of size 20. So we'd throw away the two largest and two lowest values and, uh, and use that, okay? So, um, so here we go. Um, so here, you'll see the, the simulation takes a little bit, a little bit longer. So let me just write trimmed mean example. So I'm going to say we're going to take samples of size 20. We're throwing away the, the top two and bottom two, and we're going to do this 10,000 times, or I'm sorry, 100,000 times. I'm creating myself a vector to store our trimmed mean values. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take um, 20 random normals and I'm going to sort them from smallest to largest and then I'm going to take the mean of x but I'm saying remove 1 through k which is just going to be the first two and then n minus k plus 1 so that's you know 20 minus 2 is 18 plus 1 is 19 19 and 20 so this is basically saying take out 1 2 19 and 20 and and uh, once you have them sorted, which is what we want to do, right? So uh, we run this loop, and it takes a little bit of time, okay? Just because we're giving, we're asking it to do a, a few computationally heavy things on the computer, which is sorting uh, a bunch of numbers, and then uh, we're running a loop, so it says do this a um, hundred thousand times, okay? Uh, but now we have t mean, and we can ask for the mean of our trimmed mean. And uh, is that right? Something feels off here. Let me just check my. Uh... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, the mean of the trimmed mean is wrong, but the mean squared error, okay, so the, the mean, uh, mean squared error is the difference between our estimate, the trimmed mean, minus the true value of theta, which would be the uh, actual mean, um, which would be zero, right? And then we're gonna square this, and then we're gonna take um, the mean of all of these, of our mean squared error here. So I can do that. That's um, the mean squared error, and we get uh, 0.05. And then if we want the um, kind of the uh, the standard standard error here, we would take um, take each trimmed mean value, subtract off the mean trimmed mean value. Okay, so the, the mean of our estimates, and we would. Uh, Square this difference. We would add them up and divide by m. That's that's not right either. What did I do wrong? Oh, the square root of this, of course. Okay. So. Um, so there's our standard error estimate for uh, a trimmed mean. Okay. Uh, you can think of the median as the um, as a trimmed mean also, the median of a set of numbers, because you're basically trimming off half your values, right? If you've got a sample size of 20, your your median is basically um, n over 2 minus 1 trimmed mean. 
uh, of that level because you're just basically you're sorting them and you're taking away everything except for the uh, the middle values. So, um, you know, if we wanted to talk about the trimmed mean instead of the trimmed mean, I could just do um, the median of x, and um, and we can get uh, you know what is the uh, the mean squared error for the median of x, and uh, and all of these things. Okay, so these are just um, examples of using computer simulation to give us, you know, um, high quality estimates of these true, true values without the need to, um, you know, do calculus. Okay, and I think uh, a lot of times that's all, all you want. Sometimes you want the um, the theoretical value. But uh, from a practical standpoint, um, maybe you just need an estimate. Okay. Uh, a, a neat thing is, is we can also use the um, the same principle of doing thousands of replications to kind of test our notions of hypothesis testing as well. Okay. So, for example, um, you know, how how often do we commit type one error? In general, in general, what what, what is how, how what's the probability of committing a type one error? Not the p-value. It's our significance level, which, which is often 0.05. Uh, but it's whatever we choose to be alpha, that is um, our probability of a type 1 error, right? And, um, and maybe you have, you've seen this for yourself, or you understand the theory behind it. Um, but we can also kind of just simulate this uh, ourselves here, OK? So let's say. Um, let's say we, um, we have uh, a mean of 500 and a sigma of 100, OK? And we're going to take um, random samples of size 20. OK? And what we're going to do is we're going to just repeatedly, we're going to um, take random samples of size 20, create, uh, perform a t-test to see if our sample provides evidence that, um, that the mean is different from 500, right? So um, we will re repeatedly perform t-tests to see if our sample provides evidence that the mean uh, is not 500. OK, so h0 is mu equals 500. And the, uh, the alternative will be uh, mu. Um, Oh, I guess we'll do mu, mu greater than 500, OK? okay. So how often will we um, make a mistake? So in, in our case, our data will be generated from normal 500, 100, OK? So our null hypothesis is actually true. Okay. But because of random sampling, our data could, you know, mislead us to believe that um, H0 is false. And we want to know how often does this happen? Okay. So let's say we use alpha. equal to 0 0.05, 
Okay. So I'm going to do um, 100,000, well, maybe, uh, maybe just 10,000 uh, replications. Okay. And um, just uh, storage, this is going to be storage for the p values. And I'm going to uh, run a loop that basically says, uh, we're going to take a sample of you know, 20 values, where our mu is 500 and our sigma is 100. And we're going to. Um, Test results will be, um, we're going to perform a t-test to see if um, the, the default value for t-test, you guys are familiar with running t-tests in R, right? Or no? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Okay, let's, let's do a regular old t-test, okay? So, so mu 500, sigma that, okay, alpha 0.05. Okay, so I'm going to just do this. So here I've got um, x. These are 20 values taken from a random normal distribution. And then I can just do t test of x. And this says, this tests against the, um, um, this tests if the mean of x, the mean of the population corresponding to x is equal to 0. Okay, so of course this is going to come back with uh, an infinitesimally small p-value, right? Um, because uh, the mean of our, our x values is 489. Is it equal to 0? Uh, of course not, right? Um, so if you want to specify, you'd say mu equal to 500, OK? And so in this case, we want to know, is it the, um, the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 500, and the alternative would be that it's not equal to 500, and we get a p-value of 0 0.6159 in this case. Okay, and in uh, in our example, we're doing the alternative that mu is greater than 500. So uh, I'm going to do t-test mu equal to 500, and alternative will be greater. Okay, uh, and so it's pretty much uh, the same thing. Okay. And we're doing, uh, but the uh, the true mean is greater than 500 is what we are we are uh, performing here. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to do this. Basically, mu is 500, and um, and the thing is, is when you save the results of the test, okay, you got test results. You can call. Um, is it uh, p dot value? Okay, uh, you can you can reference the p value that exists from the t test. You can just say dollar sign p value. So you can say test results p value. Okay, and then we're going to store those into p sub i. All right, so this will run ten thousand times. Every single time, it's going to draw a sample of 20, and then it's going to perform a t-test, and, uh, and it's going to store those p-values. Okay? And so you know, our decision whether or not to reject, notice that um, R does not give you a conclusion. Basically, you look at the p-value yourself and say, well, will I reject the null in this case? No. If the p-value turns out to be less than 0.05, then you say yes. Okay. So we're going to do this. And it's running 10,000 times. OK, it's done. OK, and then now we can, um, we can do true-false to see if our p's are less than alpha. OK, but um, this, I can just coerce this into, uh, into a mean. And, see, and we can see how often was our p-value 
less than alpha. Okay, and so it was uh, it was less than alpha a little over five percent of the time. It was less than alpha 526 times out of 10,000. So um, you know, if I did some, uh, we get. Uh, we see that we have we would have committed a type one error um, just a little over five percent of the time, which matches what we would expect because we're expecting to commit a type one error uh, um, with probability alpha. Is is that okay? All right. And then if we wanted to, um, uh, so this would be our p hat value. So our, our estimated um, p hat, and we can uh, you know we can get it um, the standard error of our p hat. So you just do a square root of p hat times. Th this is more um, using our understanding. Uh, p hat times one minus p hat divided by m. Okay, and that would be our um, standard error. Okay, uh, so so in this case, you know. We can use a lot of, we can use the power of our computer and things like that to answer, to answer questions, uh, without needing to uh, to do calculus and things like that. So, um, we'll we'll do a few more um, kind of these textbook -y examples of these uh, these methods here. Um, I have to think of some good homework problems um, to to have you guys, uh, you know. Explore, uh, explore this stuff, um, and uh, but uh, we'll end uh, end today's lesson there. Okay, so thanks.